All right, well, happy belated Arbor Day. We're a little off in our timing, but um, I wanted to start with an icebreaker, and there is a pun intended in there. Who had seen any damage throughout the city of Austin after Ice Storm Mara? Okay, pretty unanimous. Who saw a tree or knew a tree that was one of their favorite trees? Maybe it's on your own property, just a tree that you really loved. You saw it damaged? A little, little less, still pretty full room. Okay, uh, who saw a tree that they know or loved um, that was a fatality that actually killed the tree? Quite a bit less, yeah. That's kind of what I expected. And those trees, are they your trees if they were fatal? Okay, do you have plans to replace those trees? I'm just curious. Irreplaceable. Irreplaceable. There you go. So what I saw with uh, the Ice Storm Mar versus Winter Storm Yuri two years prior is, I can't estimate, I, you know, I, nobody has a scale like that, but I would say it was about the same amount of wood waste from both storms. The difference being Yuri had a lot more fatalities and Mara had a lot more just da straight up damage. Um, I think the big lines that we saw was really a result of everybody trying to get all that damage to a dump or some kind of landfill, some kind of recycling center all at once versus Yuri. It kind of seemed to be that everyone was like on a wait and see, maybe it'll come back, um, produce some zombie trees, some came back. It was, it was kind of a surprise all the way around, but at the end of the day, I think most of the wood waste is roughly speaking about the same from the two storms. Um, City of Austin estimates that about 10 and a half million trees were damaged from Mara. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to point out this is our big tree of the year in 2022 before I move on from that. Uh, City of Austin. Um, <clears throat> so, getting to Winter Storm Mara in particular, I'll talk about what we do know about that and what we know about ice storms. We know that ice weighs 52, uh, sorry. It's 52 pounds per cubic foot. So when you start putting all that weight on a branch, that gets pretty heavy. Um, another thing that I started thinking about is in 2007, I don't know how many of you were here, but we had a pretty significant ice storm and there was more accumulation, I thought. So I looked it up, Camp Mabry, because it's kind of central between here and uh, campus. So it turns out that there was 1.2 inches from 2007 and 0.69 inches from just 2023 here. So, but there wasn't nearly the damage. I started thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I was reminded of was after winter storm Yuri, I was enjoying the Mount Laurels. They were starting to bloom, getting full blooms, fragrant, leaning down as they often do. But the branches started breaking, which was unusual because we know about wind loads, we know about ice loads, but no one's ever heard of a flower load because that seems a little uh, counterproductive for a tree to have a branch break, just too many flowers. So it made me realize that something was definitely wrong. Um, <clears throat> so one thing, another thing that we know that uh, trees are equipped with, unless you're an ash juniper, they like to kind of go it alone and have a different uh, rigid structure but most trees have what's cleverly called stress bending as a defense, which is a, an organic polymer and it's molecules, mostly um, lignans and cellulose, and that's what gives it strength and allow to be flexible. So whether it's wind blowing, children climbing, ice or uh, snow hanging on it, generally speaking, it stops it from breaking and when when that whatever that load is, is done, it goes back into place instead of staying like that. So that's called stress bending. Um, engineers have studied it because they've tried to mimic it because it's a pretty amazing design that trees have come up with. Uh, so a couple things that I started thinking about that are a little bit different from, from what's normal, I would say, is uh, from winter storm Yuri, we started seeing a lot of frost cracks, obvious ones, the bark would slough off and it would show like clear and obvious frost cracks. Um, that's relatively normal. 
In a, in a hard freeze, you're normally going to see it on the southwest quadrant, and the reason for that is because that's the last part of the tree that's going to see the sun go down, so it'll go the, the most extreme temperature change, um, going hot to cold, so when it gets that freeze, the vascular system usually cracks. Um, and another thing is uh, we've had in 2022, we had the 11th most severe drought that we've had in the history of Austin. What happens in a drought is the uh, wood tissues, it starts to desiccate. When it desiccates, it uh, develops fissures, which are basically like drought stress cracks, and we can't really see those. So at the end of the day, what happened, or what you would normally get a strength from is tree rings, the annual tree rings, that like whether it's a, something breaking or a frost crack or a stress fracture, your annual tree rings are gonna rebuild strength over time. But because we've had year over year disturbance, we had winter storm Yuri, we had the extreme drought, then we had winter storm Mara. So really what uh, winter storm Mara did was prune, but it showed us all the um, cracks behind the smile of what we thought were pretty healthy looking trees, but little, all the little different cracks and, and weaknesses that we couldn't actually see. And that's, I believe, really because we couldn't, uh, there wasn't allowed enough time to build up the annual tree rings to give strength. And annual tree rings, some people, everyone knows it goes around the trunk, but it also goes around the stems. So all that gets strengthened every year as it builds out and out and out. When it's not allowed to, that's a result of what could happen. Um, there's no way for me to prove that unless I go to a uh, dendrochronologist and ask them to do a cross section of every single break. So if we had three breaks on every tree, we're talking 31 and a half million breaks just to prove that. I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't think anyone's going to do that. But I feel pretty confident that in those cross sections, you're going to see those frost cracks and those stress fractures. And I think that's a big part of what we saw in Mara that you didn't see in 2007. And I will ask if there's any questions on that before I move on. Well, I, I will say that that confirms that we have to open up here. Ice storms are kind of a normal thing. I mean, right. We've got ice storm, but I don't remember damage like this ever. Exactly. And, and so that, that, that really is a compelling yeah. theory. It's not just the storm, but what happened before the storm. What leads up to it, yeah. That's yeah, it's the attrition, basically, yeah. What about the, the way the junipers twisting break? It's really destructive on a lot of them. Did, did you see any of those? Or? Yeah, I did. Um, so there was not a lot of wind, but there was enough wind that, and again, that's the difference between ash junipers and most trees that have that stress bending polymer that I talked about. Um, they like to take the road less traveled by and just do that rigid architecture. And by doing that, even just a little bit of wind and ice as it accumulates and the wind is, is twisting and just, it's, it's not made to stress bend, so it's not coming back. So it sounds like you're observing, so that I would observe on my property with Blanca where the, the ash junipers were bowed by the weight of the ice, they never went back up. Right. Because yeah. they didn't have that stress fitting molecule structure. Exactly, yeah. They just have a different type of architecture. Um, most trees, most species have the stress bending architecture, but ash junipers, junipers and a few other prefer to be just rigid. They think they're going to be able to take anything, I guess. Question. Um, someone I know got the idea when they realized that it was going to be so severe. They, they put a fire pit in a wheelbarrow and walked around in the trees and let the heat melt the ice. Was that good? I mean, it, could, it helped, but was that a good idea? Or is that like really causing more damage by the that, that when the temperature swing you mentioned? Hmm. I hadn't given that forethought because I've never heard of something like that. Uh, that seems pretty labor intensive, but I think it'd be functional because I don't think anything's going to burn the tissues or anything um, in those temperatures and that moisture. 
So right. 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 I do know that another uh, option that people do is wrap it in Christmas lights. Um, just, just, just that slight bit of warmth is just enough. So I have to wonder the fact that that ice stayed so long because in you know when things would break in the neighborhood, it just this big gunshot sound. And it was happening for days. Like that ice, I never saw a drip coming off that ice for at least three days. And I don't ever remember that from previous storms. You know, yeah. usually the sun came out and it would Smart. let some of it go. I just, in 07, it was one day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is something to be said for the length of time. Because um, <clears throat> I guess with any of us, you know, can hold up, wait for so long, but after a while you get fatigued, but, um, yes. So, this, you know, the cedar trees, when they break, I would say like it looks kind of ugly, because it, it, like it doesn't break off the way an oak tree, is that really like it just, this, this horrible gash? Right. Is that related to it not the, the stress bending polymer? Yeah. <clears throat> it's um it's basically yeah it's uh internal tissues are different its fibers are different um it's uh much more fibrous instead of just those little molecules intertwined um it's the other, other thing about the ash junipers unlike in oak or a lot of the other species that we had is that um it is really poor at compartmentalizing to to sealing that wound uh, so you will just probably forever to see that open wound, whereas some of the other trees might make that effort to try and close at least somewhat. Um, so I was that did remind me of something I was going to bring up. Um, that a couple of the theories were that it was because their evergreens have more surface area. These are theories I've heard quite a bit, um, which is true. But the top four trees that were damaged, there was live oak, there was ash juniper, then there was cedar elm, and then there was um, the uh, the one everyone loves so much, honeysuckle. Um, so yeah, two evergreen, two deciduous. Um, so it's not exclusive to that at all. Um, another theory that I heard is that it's because of lack of pruning which you could say that because there's excess weight because it hasn't been pruned right up. Um, but I would argue that if you go into a forest, no one's pruning it or there's very little pruning. And I would double that down by saying Dr. Ed Gilman from the University of Florida did a lot of uh, wind test studies with this huge wind machines that have different velocities. He did all these studies with and realized that you need all those branches to cause uh, what's create what's called mass wind damping. And it's kind of the same idea as if you throw down a sheet of plywood so a forklift can drive and not break into the infrastructure, you're, you're dispersing that, that load. Um, so it's actually a good thing to have all that, even though it is extra weight. But. I will say my cedar on island, there are cold cedar on island. Yes. Sir. And they got through just fine. And I thought, boy, I would like it. Yeah. And then we had some wind. Uh, you know, maybe a month or two later. Right. And suddenly I have wounds down from cedar. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, there were some that kind of came late. Um, cedar realms do a little bit naturally have a, uh, a, a poor structure because they have what's called included bark a lot of times, which is they have um, two stems that are the same size and then they share what's the same bark instead of. So basically, like any time you have a union, a U is better than a V. It's a lot stronger, and cedar elms a lot of times have that V. They have that included bark right here, so they can fail more often than other species. But um, <clears throat> so I'm going to move on to uh, well, there's a couple more, some right here. I'm going to move on to oak wilt, um, and the reason. I'm talking about oak wilt. I'm sure people are always concerned about it, but what I kept hearing from this ice storm is that 
And, and on the news, I saw a lot. They were saying that the wind is going to cause a much worse oak wilt year. Um, so I was going to kind of define a little bit about oak wilt. Uh, see if I got a couple leaves here. I'm going to pass these on each side just to show the difference. Um, but <clears throat> one is a leaf that has came from a tree with oak wilt, and the other one is a tree that has, is chlorotic. And so the difference is, in the oak wilt leaf, you'll see the brown veins, it's called venal necrosis, and that's really what oak wilt does. Most pests and diseases are bullies, and they go after the weakest they can find and just take down a tree that's already stressed out. Oak wilt is not like that. Oak wilt goes after the healthiest trees because it uses the transpiration cycle as its way of manifesting itself into the canopy. And the oak, trying to stop that, starts to kind of close the vascular system to prevent it from going up in the canopy. Well, the oak wilt is patient and it can outweigh the oak tree. And in that time, you'll start to see the tree uh, pretty much um, start to die of dehydration, which is the venal necrosis. And the chlorotic leaf is completely different. It just has a nutrition deficiency. It's uh, iron manganese that it's missing. So it isn't necessarily fatal. You can just give it a little iron manganese and it'll be fine. So it can photosynthesize. If you don't do anything after years and years, it'll die because it can't photosynthesize and it can't get its energy every year. But <clears throat> To kind of summarize oak wilt, red oaks are the tree that allows the cycle to keep going because there's a fungal mat under the bark on a red oak. And it has a very sweet smell. And there's a little bug called a nitidulid. It's a beetle. And it has a sweet tooth. And it can smell that fungal mat and go under the bark and get on that fungal mat. But then it gets spores on its legs then it smells fresh uh, wound, whether it's a cut or a break, which is also sweet smelling. If it's living tissue, if it's dead tissue, it won't smell sweet. And it'll go to that, and that's what can inoculate the tree with oak wilt, which is why we paint when we make a cut. Um, so now understanding that, the other more common way that trees get oak wilt is through their root system. And when they're the same species, their roots um, actually graft together. And so that oak wilt is spread through the root system. And that's a much harder fight because then you're dealing with injections in most places because you can't trench because of infrastructure in the ground. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, the point is, the, the reason I don't think we have to worry too much about this being a much bigger oak wilt uh, season with problems, more than average, it's always a problem, is because even though it was a warmer than average January, which allowed the fungal mat and the beetle to be mature or to be active, they weren't mature yet. And so when that freeze happened, we had three or four days before it started warming up again. Three or four days is all it takes for that wound, whatever size it wound it was, to no longer have that sweet smell and be attractive to that nitidulid. So a couple of weeks later, now your fungal mat is mature, your beetle's starting to get mature, but all those wounds, if you didn't tend to them, if they just sat there, they're okay. The only concern would be if a branch is hinged and still at attached to the vascular system, so it's still somewhat alive, and then it breaks off, now you have a fresh wound and the, the beetle is mature. So that is a concern, but when they kept saying on the news about wind being an issue, I can kind of see that where it might blow down a branch, but they kept talking about the fungal mat, and I'm like, so you're saying that a spore is going to blow out from under there and blow right onto a fresh wound? It seems pretty improbable. So I will say that it's not likely, it's possible, but not probable that we're going to have a worse oak wilt season just because of the ice storm. And that's really the reason why I wanted to talk about oak wilt, because I've heard, had a lot of people be worried about it and ask me about it, but I think it's going to be just another normal year.
have a question. Yes. So we have a fault in our neighborhood, and we estimate it's about 10 years away. And we're going to throw the fun from just side. Yes. We've heard from other people in our neighborhood that no, no one knows of anyone that it's been successful for. But my question is, I have oak seedlings popping up everywhere because of, of the last five years, 10 years, I've been bringing bags and leaves from other places. So I don't have, they're not live oaks. I'm not sure what they are yet. Right. <laughs> so how long does it take for the roots to fuse? Will those little babies fuse with the existing ones before the oak will pass us through? Or will they perhaps not get sick? I mean, it perhaps not. Um, on campus, for example, the reason why it's really hard for us to get rid of it, we've had it, we've known to have it since the early 80s, is because it's cyclical, because we have so many live oaks, and every time we treat it, it just keeps coming back around the same circle. You can run it off into this quadrant and quell it for two years, but then it'll push off to this quadrant, and then it just comes, keeps coming back around. So if you live in a neighborhood where it's a little more linear, you have a sporting chance because that fungus fungicide that when you eject it will last approximately two years and the hope is again going back to those tree rings that within those two years you're actually concealing the oak wilt of the infected symptomatic tree and it's not able to spread as, anymore because that also is going to include your root system um, i'm sorry so we we're forced to do injection because Again, the, the underground infrastructure, we can't trench. Trenching is a great tool, but you, you know, you need a lot of land because um, you have to go down about four to five feet. So do you recommend retreating after a period of a couple of years? Yeah, well, I recommend monitoring. So around two years, you will start to notice if it's still in the area, you will start seeing signs of it again. So then certainly treat. Um, I would not recommend treating just because, uh, because what's happening is when you're doing those injections, you go up two to three inches and over two to three inches. So if you keep doing that, eventually you're starting to girdle that trunk because you're getting a wound that's going to compartmentalize and you're actually going to have those wounds in the cambium layer all the way around. So after a while, you're starting to get all that scar tissue, then the cambium layer's having a hard time functioning, so try and avoid it. So we have, we have a lot of people in our neighborhood who do have ash in the oak, but there's others in that oak trees that are just in decline. Right. And they're just, they're alive year after year. The canopy is reduced and reduced and reduced. So what's going on with those? I mean, there's a, it's hard to say for sure, knowing, not knowing the area. There's a lot of things that can cause oak wilt decline. Um, but again, going back to that oak wilt specifically attacks healthy oaks. It doesn't attack stressed out oaks because their, their transpiration pull is just not as strong. Um, so you, you almost always see in a stand of oaks, the, the least pleasant looking ones are the ones that survive. Um, but it can be like soil compaction, it can be um, some other, uh, can be another pest or disease that does attack stressed out trees. It's hard to say without looking at it. But. In, in terms of species, I mean, I'm kind of shocked, shocked to hear. We have read a sort of the uh, sort of nexus yeah. uh, for, for the beetles. But they, I'm under the impression they survive better. Uh, the five oaks are the ones that are really you know, sort of victimized the most by oak wilt. Is that not a correct uh, feeling? I mean, how, how do various species survive? Yeah, well, we just have a lot more live oaks around this area than we do red oaks, so you see it a lot more. Um, but I will tell you that when, you, by the time you realize that a red oak is symptomatic, it lasts three to six weeks. And when a live oak is symptomatic, it lasts three to six months. So um, live oaks, when they do get oak wilt, they don't last long at all. Um, they don't stand a chance, but we don't have as many. Uh, another thing people were wondering about is maybe the freeze killed off the, or froze up the fungal mat and killed the beetle. But another state that really has a problem with oak wilt is Minnesota. So obviously freezes are a non-issue. 
they do have way more red oaks than live oaks there, so they see it all the time. Do you treat it with fungicide and not even insecticide to kill the, the beetles or both? No, the beetles are just a vector. They're just carrying it. Um, they're not really attacking the tree. So there's, there's, and they're almost impossible to see. You like, it's a chance if you happen to see one. Um, they're like the size of a head of a pin. So um, and you, people have tried to put out traps. They're just really hard to catch. They're hard to detect. We know they're around. They can travel wind blowing. They can travel up to a mile. Um, so if you have neighbors that have oak wilt, sometimes it's a concern. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really no reason to treat for them. It's, it's the only known vector with the exception, I think it was in uh, Virginia, somewhere closer to the East Coast. They did do a study that showed that squirrels also have a sweet tooth, were gnawing on that fungal mat and got it on their teeth and then went and were gnawing on a fresh wound. So. Squirrels could be a vector, but you can't kill all the squirrels, so. <laughs> so I had thought about you hunting a red oak, um, you know, because we've got space in our yard now. Right. But this, this is making me think maybe that wouldn't be a good idea because we have a lot of live oaks around. Yeah. I'm not anti-red oak, but I do understand how the process works, and it makes me nervous to plant new red oaks, personally. Um, so you talked about how the tree roots would crack together. Is that something that happens with most trees? It happens. There's no known case where it happens within different species, but with most trees, it happens within the same species quite commonly. So, yep. Did you say the ash does do that? They do. They do. Yeah. So what would you say about um, in terms of the vector being humans because with the uh, and I have friends that have been driving in Hayes County right. and talking about it and they live out there, have a ranch or whatever, and they were saying they could their theory is that the road crews are causing it to spread because they trim along highways was their theory and that the oak is following the crews. So Getting this wind type thing, and right. I was like, ah. So what do you have to say about that? So, <clears throat> two two little known things about oak wilt and preventing and treating. Um, they, I don't want to say don't exercise caution. Always exercise caution because any oak tree, any type of oak tree, can get oak wilt if it's in an uh, oak wilt center and there's enough oak wilt pressure within those root systems. Any type of oak can. There's just some that are a lot more oak wilt resistant. Um, so I would always just, you can treat the blade, but really when you treat the blade with bleach or Lysol or whatever, um, what that's for is because if you're cutting a red oak and you hit that fungal mat, now that saw is a vector, um, if that makes sense, because you're carrying the spore over. And as far as painting, I would just exercise painting every oak, every cut. Um, but the reason why you're painting is because you're putting that nitidulid off the scent because it's sweet smell. Spray a little paint, can't smell it anymore. That's what you're doing. Um, and they sell the oil-based pruning paint, which is actually terrible because it kills the natural hormones in the tree that help it um, seal that wound. So just the cheapest latex paint you can find is perfect. <laughs> You need to paint it as soon as you possibly can. I actually recommend if you can't have an assistant that can be right behind you as soon as you cut it and paint it, that you cut it, put your saw down, paint it, cut, paint, cut, paint, um, just leapfrog that way because it's not worth it. Um, I've seen other beetles that I know are not nitidulids jump on a, on a wound immediately. Um, so I know it does happen like really quick, so it's worth it to paint as soon as you possibly can. So it does happen. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple other things I was gonna get to uh, real quick. I was gonna ask, I won't get to everything, but I was gonna ask just because I want to see how much people in this room know, but if you had to choose one in your tree, would you rather have the ball moths, raise of hands? Which, 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 
Mistletoe. Or the mistletoe, raise of hands. Right. Pretty good, pretty good. Um, so ball moss is actually an epiphyte. It's just an air plant. It's re related to bromeliads, related to pineapple, related to Spanish moss. The leaves, it actually absorbs all the water and nutrients it needs to live through the leaves. So it doesn't need anything from the tree. That's just a host for it to be on. I exercise this point by showing people, sometimes you'll see ball moss growing on the side of a brick building. Some, you know, just the little pores in the mortar are just enough for it to cling to. Sometimes you'll see it on an abandoned car. Don't tell me that it's killing that car. <laughs> but now this mistletoe, it is a uh, hemi parasite, which means it can actually live on its own if it absolutely had to. But what it would prefer to do is suck the life out of the tree. Um, so it can go either way, but if the, if the tree is defenseless and allows it, it'll just keep sending tentacles into the tree stem. And really the only way to get rid of that is cutting at least eight inches from the union that you see it towards the trunk. So unfortunately that means sometimes you're having to cut off entire large limbs to get rid of it. Um, one thing I don't know if you do know, I think that's me. Um, uh, if the name comes from ancient Anglo-Saxon, which means dung twig, so it's really poop on a stick, and it's because <laughs> the berries are so sticky when the birds eat it and they're flying, just that little bit of the berry can land on a tree and infect that tree. So if the mistletoe is growing out of the trunk of the tree, is that it just probably is fruit? Pretty much, okay. yeah. I mean, sometimes, sometimes you can do a heading cut if it's way up on the trunk, but it's pretty low down. Probably, yeah, it's not a good thing. How long does it take for it to die? Um, I mean, you're probably safe the first year, but after that, it doesn't take too long. Okay. So, sorry. I got to choose Right. So, um... I'm going to ask one last question, just to get a poll of the room. <clears throat> Who likes ash junipers? Okay. Just seeing if I want to tread in that water or not. <laughs> okay, well, for those of you that like ash junipers, come talk to me offline and I'll tell you some things that are in their defense. But I don't want to make some people mad. <laughs> Yes. Is it true that they suck up a lot more water than the oaks do than the other trees are? So, yes, they do. It's one of the things I was going to talk about. Um, so, <clears throat> actually, those in all trees, whether no matter how much they suck up, what there's that uh, metaphor that I love, which is basically that trees are rivers to the sky. So, yes, ash junipers do suck up a lot of water but they only use about 5% of it. 95% of it goes into a evapotranspiration. So it's going back into the atmosphere and it's helped keep us cool and it's not really wasting the water, it's cooling the entire ecosystem. So it's not exactly stealing your water. I read that the, a lot of this area was clear cut for farming and that the ash creepers were invasive and just kind of took over after that land was not clear cut anymore? Is, am I correct in that assumption that they're not actually native? Or they're they, they are native. Um, they are, there's an, a difference between an invasive and kind of an aggressive tree. They're somewhat aggressive. Um, they like their, you know, kind of elbow their way in a little bit to the crowd. But um, they're, no, they are native. Um, they just, they were allowed to, to take over a little bit more. Didn't there used to be more tree variety in the area? There did, yeah, uh, at one point. I know you don't want to tread into this water because it's contentious. But I'm wondering if we could just like stick to the like, what, what scientists know us facts to the best of our knowledge. Because I know that like, I think it was Ellen Oxfair like proposed this 
to all the action curves, which I mean, not necessarily the tricks we focus on, but right. um, yeah, like, I don't know, it seems like there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I don't have a stake in the game, I just kind of want to know. Right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> a little bit of the misinformation is that that's not going to do you any good if you're cutting down all the ash junipers on your five acre ranch, let's say, um, because a male ash juniper produces 500 million or billion, sorry, grains of pollen. And that pollen can go from central Texas to Oklahoma. So cutting them down in five acres is just really not doing any good. I do understand, I sympathize, I don't get cedar fever, but I sympathize with those that do. Um, <clears throat> I would say instead of chopping them all down, a UT professor came up with a good idea. I don't drink gin, but if you drink gin and if you have cedar fever, um, she came up with a brilliant idea of using the berries from the female ash juniper to produce the gin so that you're building a tolerance for the local juniper. <laughs> All right. Another excuse to drink gin. And then you don't go very soon. Laura, I'll tell the friend who eats a berry every day starting in October. That's another great way to do it. I have heard of that. Yep. Well, Carrie told me that. Where is she? And that works? Yes. Yes. What about the sap? Could you do something with the sap too? Because I know some people actually chew. I mean, in the same sense, you could, that would make sense. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it would be the same concentrations as the berry itself. Um, I don't know. I, I can't say. It's speculate, but I feel like it's a yeah. little different makeup, but be worth a try. I like to go ahead. I just think it's important to point out some of the things that the tree does for us. Oh, oh absolutely. Holding shallow hill country soils in place is right. a very important one. Yeah. And being a very critical piece of the uh, habitat required for the golden chief warbler is another one. Right. An endangered species, which is right here on this property. Uh, we can't we can't come on down without losing a lot of value to the ecosystem. And there's actually a bill in the legislature that's been passed by the House that everybody should be able to cut down all the junipers they want. Right. Which is ridiculous. Yes. A political so, thing, not scientific. So yeah, I um I would say yeah. I would say ash juniper or any any tree, any plant, you, you're gonna just clear cut and get rid of. You are gonna change the ecosystem. And if you change the ecosystem and then you notice the ecosystem is unhealthy, just remember we're part of the ecosystem. We don't own the ecosystem. So try and try not to change it too much, you know, because we're all responsible and we're part of it. I heard this great analogy one time that um, we can be in the ecosystem. We can be like the brain thinking we're in charge of all the other organs, not realizing that if we just don't, if we mistreat the other organs, then we won't get what we need to survive. So, I, I like to call the asking for a pioneer of the species. But, uh, but I, I will say it's interesting, you know, around here, we value them for, for golden sheets, right? We right. make the point that the golden sheets come for the ask for the part of what they need. Uh, but I was in a conversation with uh, Jim O'Donnell next door, and they, it just uh, listed as, I guess, threatened the bracket and twist flowers, all right? And, and I said, well, isn't that, a, isn't that a, way, a good thing to have uh, even more protection? Because, well, it turns out that the botanist who was sort of in charge of the study, or one of the lead botanists who, who studied the bracket and twist flower, believes there are too many uh, junipers and that there should be more. But you just can't win. Yeah. You know, no, you can't. That's why I took a pull. So. Um, I could talk about a lot of other stuff. Uh, I'm sure you probably know about a lot of it, <clears throat> but um, I was just gonna say, I, I'm guessing we're probably gonna have to wrap up soon, so I didn't know if there's any just outright questions about trees. Um, I will say, don't fertilize without doing a soil test. Go on. A question about a lot of the dead wood from the, from the uh, trees. Yes. A lot of the neighbors had their trees, of course, mulched, and the city was mulching, and people were spreading the mulch, and the chips all over the property right which from a fire control perspective raises questions about more 
kindling for if there's a wildfire. Right. So do you have a policy or a perspective on that? Because, uh, you know, my concern is about what happens if in this area in the drought in the summertime and everybody's got all these wood chips that's been all over the place that could really be spread. Be spread. All it takes one, one ember a mile away, that thing. Right, that's something and that's been documented in other parts of California and other places. So is there some kind of pro or con on the wood chip issue? It's not spreading? Um. I will say uh, kind of a, a unique approach that I like to do um, is the same concept as Hugo culture. Is anyone familiar with that? Okay, so um, kind of the same concept. So if you are able to get that many wood chips to your property to spread it around, surely you can get the same amount of or close to of soil or compost or some kind of humus or something like that to mix in with it. And what that's going to do is it's going to retard the, the, the fire danger and it's also going to start slowly. It's going to keep it moist and start breaking it down. Um, it's really going to help the entire surrounding uh, whatever trees you have on your property because it will start making mycorrhizae and the hyphae can go like miles in any direction. It's you're just starting with changing that uh, mulch trail path and uh, making it safe but also like helping the uh, entire forest floor that way. That's not, what, that's not what's happening. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is people got truckloads of literally a yeah. free mulch that they could, or you know, chips because it was there. Yeah. And they spread because it was, it was there. Right. They're not, gonna, they're not going back out and hauling in compost, et cetera, and spreading. But yeah. It's, it's a one-off. It's a one -off. And yes. So the problem is, in, in this neighborhood just south of here, just uh, east of here, right. they live down, they live down the creek. There's lots of acres with lots of freshly chipped, most of it's cedar or juniper. Yeah. It's spread all over the place. Yeah. And nobody's going back in and amending it. So right. Yeah. No, there's there's a lot of lack of um, instruction to go with this storm. Um, you know, again, I talked about the news, kept talking about wind storms and how it's going to spread oak wilt much more likely is people chipping up their red oaks that have oak wilt and spreading it around that way because that's very viable. So. Roy, you, uh, you mentioned don't fertilize without doing a soil test. Do you have any resources that you recommend for getting soil tests for private landowners? Um, if you go to Texas A&M's uh, ag website, they're a great resource because they're going to tell you exactly how to get a proper soil test and they're also going to tell you how to mail it off and it's pretty affordable like $30 um, might be 35 now I don't know that's still pretty affordable it's worth doing uh, <clears throat> to fertilize without doing that is really malpractice because you're treating for something that you don't know what it is um, I will say that the macronutrients that are on every package whether it's bag bottle or box they're you probably don't need those. You rarely need macronutrients. Um, you, the potassium and phosphorus in Central Texas, they will tell you at A&M, almost every sample they get has plenty of potassium and phosphorus already. It may not be, <clears throat> it's available. It may not be able to be taken up by the tree, which is a separate issue, but it's there. So it's usually the micronutrients that you really need. Um, but you got to figure out which ones you need. Do they give recommendations when they provide your test results? Yes, they absolutely do. Awesome. Yep. So should there be a certain, uh, I mean, we have recommended recommended dates of when to trim uh, oak, live oaks. Right. But I, I do not know there were certain dates to trim red oaks. Same dates. Same dates. Yeah. But that's not publicized. It's not. It's, again, you know, the... the uh, marketing of knowledge is kind of lacking oftentimes okay. uh, i wish it was better i will say like a really good way to get just a basic um, natural fertilizer that's going to be relatively harmless is <clears throat> if you can leave the let the trees do their own nutrient cycling and leave the leaves on the ground they're going to have 15 nutrients and minerals in them it's going to be great. It builds up duff, breaks down into humus. And also, through evapotranspiration, 
some of those nutrients, the same 15, they're going to dehydrate on the leaves. So the next time it rains, run out under a tree with all your pots and put them under there and you get a great compost tea. So I'm asking you to generalize here, but generally speaking, if you see a tree and it's like leaning, why is it too bad? <laughs> there can be a lot of reasons for it. Usually it's when it's young. Um, it, uh, and it depends on the species too, um, but usually there's a, a root issue it didn't get established before it started doing that. There are some species that you'll actually, they'll start growing up in the middle of the trunk um, just because they know that they want to reach vertically. Um, but it's, it's almost always a root issue. Um, some soils, of course, that's one of the things I was to talk about, but I'm sure you probably all know that tree roots are two to three times as wide as the canopy and they only go down the deepest is about 18 inches. So they're much wider than most people think and not deep. And so that's part of the problem a lot of times why some, sometimes you see in an ice storm where they tip over because they don't have that tap root. Every tree starts with a tap root. Most of them over time, they lose their tap root. A few species keep their tap root like a pecan, which is great because it can get into that groundwater. Um, eucalyptus in Australia, they figured out recently goes down, <clears throat> pulls up the heavy metals from the ground. They can detect if there's gold in the ground, so it's kind of like a money tree. <laughs> so I have a question about mulch around the tree. Mm -hmm. like I've seen mounds, mounds, you know, put up the, the trunk. Right. What, what is the... Term is volcano mulching, and yeah. it's really bad um, because Yes, wider is better than tall. Um, and you don't want it on the trunk at all. You can go up, you know, I just say an inch, you know, you can go up to a half inch, but you can even go two inches away from the trunk. Don't touch the trunk because the roots are designed where they have a waxy coating so that they're perfectly fine being underground, being wet. The trunk is not, it's not okay with that. So as soon as you start putting mulch up there and it gets wet, you start, you end up with what's called crown rot. And if it gets bad enough, the tree will break right between the root system, the, the trunk flare where the roots, structural roots, roots meet the trunk. So volcano, volcano mulching bad. Anything else? Um, I will say, I'm just going to talk about a little bit, because I think you probably all know that trees seal, they don't heal, they're not like us, they get a cut, they, um, you know, or we get a cut rather, it's just going to heal up and we'll go on with just the way it was before that cut, whereas a tree is going to seal up uh, its compartmentalization of decayed tissue. And so it's going to just seal up that area and just never really think about it again. It's not, it doesn't heal. Um, <clears throat> trees get this callus tissue. This is a china berry. It's all I could find before I came out. Um, but it's not the best at compartmentalizing. Some trees are much better. I've always wanted to see somebody make a coffee table book about which species are better, but that's probably just me. Um, <laughs> But they can seal, this callus tissue can seal over about a third of an inch a year and it has to seal up the whole wound within five years before you have to worry about decay. So it kind of depends on the species, but it also depends on the size of the cut. So that's why you don't want to make really big cuts that you know there's no way that it's going to seal over. Um, in terms of like the ice storm where we had these breaks, um, if you have a six inch stem that snapped off right in the middle instead of going up and doing a proper cut to the trunk, I would recommend just leaving about a foot. It's gonna look weird. Um, I've said we've embraced ugly fruit as a society. We can embla embrace ugly trees. There's just gonna be a little nub there. And the point of that is so that it's gonna keep that decay within that nub instead of going into the trunk. Because if you do a proper cut, it doesn't seal up, that decay is going in the trunk, now you got a problem in your trunk, so. Yes. 
what what are the months that you should stay within when planting trees planting yeah um so really you know pretty sure you're aware that we have weird years but um generally speaking i would say between october and march okay. is quite safe sometimes you can leak into april okay. sometimes you can leak into september okay but yeah that's why we have Texas Arbor Day because it's the Arbor Day is too hot really most times to plant. So. So if you if you plant in April, you want to be more diligent about watering. And yeah, if if you know you and you're really diligent about watering, then you could probably get away with it. And uh, I don't, you, I've seen it done in August, but um, okay. but it's tough. Yeah. Um, What's the proper angle to cut? If you have a branch and you're going to cut, do you want it parallel with the trunk or do you want it at the angle? So you want it at the, it's kind of hard looking back when it's doing this, yeah. but you want it at the same angle as how it's coming out of okay. the trunk or if it's coming off a larger stem, but you want to cut it at the same angle that it's coming out of that. And there's also what's, you know, say my shoulder is it. Um, there's what's called a branch collar mm -hmm. and you want to go just outside of the branch collar because that is the reaction zone that's where all the hormones are so you see like a little flare it's harder to see on some species than others but you want to go just outside of that because that's where all those hormones are that are going to come in and protect there's four walls of defense that are part of the sealing process and um, if you do a flush cut which makes me cringe not only is the wound bigger in diameter, but also you're just cutting that whole reaction zone off. And so that's not related to rain, not keeping it at a certain angle, so it doesn't get wet? No, no. So you're hoping that it's a, a cut that's going to be able to seal and be a non-issue. Um, I will say, uh, when I talk about those four walls of defense that oaks, we're talking about gin already, so you'd be happy to hear this, that oaks um, have... A really strong tannin so if you see probably right after the ice storm you'll see oak branches break they start turning color it's kind of like taking a bite out of an apple it changes color really fast that's those tannins that's the first wall of defense it is the weakest but it helps keep out pests and it helps keep out uh, decay so that's that's why that's there but those same tannins are naturally in oak and that's what gives whiskey and wine that oak flavor Not that I'm encouraging anything. Mm -hmm. Good. Good question. If yep. we have some land that has been recently dosed around a pond and there's been sand pushed around the trees, does that sand act like mulch? What also does that sand need to be pulled away from those trees? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly better than mulch because it's just, you know, doesn't hold water nearly as much as mulch, but it'd still be advisable to pull it away. Um, sand can still hold enough moisture, especially when it's thick, to uh, get things like mildew, um, which you wouldn't want either. So if you can get it away, it's best. It's preferable, yeah. Try to get it away. Yeah. Any other questions? So I heard that it's, um, you know, when we trim off a tree, we're like, oh, it looks so good, it looks so healthy, but. It's never healthier. It never makes a tree healthier when you prune it. Is that true? So Dr. Shivo, who is the person that discovered coated or compartmentalization, he also said that um, a bad prune is much worse than no pruning at all, which is very true. Uh, see if I can make this really quick summary of one of my favorite stories about pruning <clears throat> but it took place in Chernobyl and um, Kiev so in Pripyat and Kiev were like twin sisters that were started about the same time to be modern cities and then we all know what happened in Chernobyl so <clears throat> that area became apocalyptic and you know uninhabitable and whereas Kiev kept going, kept coming, being a modern city. Um, 
and all the while in Chernobyl, nature started taking over again. And there's great pictures if you want to go look them up later. But you see, like, coming through these buildings, these massive trees, and they look amazing. And they, they do have a few issues, like auxins are the hormone that allows a tree to go taller. So <clears throat> they're a little bit shy in auxins, so they're not as tall as they should be. Um, but they're incredibly healthy, and the ecosystem's amazingly healthy. Um, and now you compare that to Kiev, and the trees are in terrible shape because they're poorly maintained, they're poorly pruned, and it's over the exact same duration that these trees got started. They were all young trees at the same time. Uh, and it's just really a, a testament to good pruning, proper pruning, versus no pruning at all. Um, so yeah, in, in Kiev, they pretty much had to replace most of their trees much sooner than they needed to be. Are the trees in Chernobyl cleaning and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, helping to, to get the, the toxins, uh, toxins with the, yeah. the contamination out? Is that yeah, I mean, again, the tree roots do pull out heavy metals from the soil, um, and the, the canopy is a natural air filter, which is amazing. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's not making it a great yeah. place to take your kids next summer, but it's, <laughs> but it's better than it was, for sure, with, with their help. <laughs>